part one questions and when you want so to make that transition. Noon and then uh, the food will be here and should be ready by noon, but um, you know, none of us, well, I would not start if I didn't eat at noon. But uh, <laughs> I don't think, I, I think, if, I think if the spirit carries us for another five, ten minutes after the noon, okay. um, we can probably handle that, but it's, um, we'll try and see what, where we're at at 12. Okay? Sounds good. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was something you said part way through that made me think about the video that you sent, um, and actually kind of contrasting uh, the prayers in, in the other video we saw too. And when you were praying, uh, it was very Lutheran, and you prayed, you know, they didn't know the in your mercy response, but I noticed that you said it in a different voice and in a different tone, and people caught on very quickly. and. Earlier you'd said that, you know, you, you didn't think of telling them or instructing them to do that. But would you, if you could go back, instruct them in that, in that setting anyways? Because it seemed to go well and it, it flowed. And if you stopped to give instructions how we're going to pray, would that interrupt the flow? What's your thought on that? And that kind of a crisis service. Yeah. That's an interesting question. I, I really... Oh, no, I, I, I often do when I'm in situations where I'm not in front of the faithful, I'll say, you know, the congregation's response to according to mercy is hear our prayers. I, I often do just say a little quick something like that. Uh, in, in that situation, I totally just <laughs> forgot. <laughs> but I, I agree, it, it actually turned out really well. Like I, I think that it, it, in, in some ways it was better that I didn't. Didn't feel... Like it felt natural, it didn't, the prayer didn't come across as standing up and doing something big and formal. It was very um, organic. Yeah. In, in yeah. a good way, not in a loosey goosey, yeah. but in a, right. this, this felt part of the service. It wasn't, yeah. Yeah. now we're going to do the Lutheran thing. And, and I would also point out on that note, too, just, just a quick thing about that. Like some, the prayer, you know, the way, the way we pray, the way we pray. Um, where we have a, a response, it, it allows the congregation or the people to, to, to be involved in the prayer, right? So, so for example, like like uh, there was other prayers that night too, where 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 the pastor kind of just prayed for ten minutes and everybody bowed their heads, and I think that's that's fine too. But I had a lot of people say that they they appreciated because this was for them too, right? And they had the that they that they were then had the uh, uh, ability to participate in that prayer, right? By, being able to respond, and I think that that was uh, that was well received, yeah, for sure. Anybody else have anything from the from the last uh, session? I remember that far back. <laughs> A couple of foosball games under the belt. Okay. Well, maybe I'll just carry on here, and, and then if, if something uh, pops up, we can we can do that. So. So the, the last session there that we, we were talking uh, about uh, about sort of what actually happened, the, the actual events, maybe some of the thought processes that led up to, to, to my participating in that, maybe some of the internal battles that I, I had to deal with, knowing our theology on, on these things and, and whatnot. And in the end, uh, I, I believe that, that um, it was uh, a matter of acting. Uh, Pastorally, if you want to put it that way, that, that went into the decision to to, to, to do to participate and, and, and do what I did there, um, and so that was the when, when it just happened. But of course, when there, when, it, when a situation happens like this, it, it, it's not just over. It's not like uh, Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, and all of a sudden you're, you're it, it's all done. So. In this next session, I'd like to look at how the ministry happened in the in the days after the crash, and what, what all happened there. And so, the truth is, when you're in the midst of a of, of a crisis, you uh, uh, people emotions are high, people are clinging to life. There's all sorts of things like that going on. People are going through this roller coaster of emotions, and uh, the truth is, when we when we're in in the middle of all of that, uh, it, it's easy for us to kind of maybe sometimes go. Well, you know, uh, uh, it's just too much. <laughs> you know what I mean? But the truth is, when when this, when this is all going on, um, this is our greatest opportunity. 
this is one of the greatest opportunities that we'll ever have uh, to minister to the gospel. Um, this is what we signed up for, to be honest with you. As pastors, when we to be able to be on the front line and in, in, a, in a situation like that, I can't think of anything more useful as a pastor to, to be able to do that, to be able to do that. Uh, I wouldn't want to do it again. <laughs> uh, I, I can tell you that. But but at the time, it, it felt really good to be useful, to be to be uh, uh, serving God, to be useful in His kingdom, and to be the boots on the ground right there, where, where, right at right at the ground zero. Yeah. Um, so just looking at your first your first point there again, it kind of struck me like to be a voice of the gospel, you need to have a seat at the table. And I was almost thinking, you know, you have ca t table capitalized there. Like oh, the sorry. table, I mean, kind of got me thinking about the table of the Lord. To be a voice of the gospel, yeah. it needs to be filled up. Right. Um, so, are, do you have any suggestions for or ways that you handled um, getting yourself filled up by the gospel at this time? Did your devotional life oh, take yeah. a turn? Or <laughs> yeah. After the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, I, I, we, we, I'm going to get into that here in just a okay. minute about, about all of that. So that's good. That's sure. a good question. That's actually just dovetails nicely to what I was just going to talk about here. So. Um, you know, the, the, the truth is that 95% of the time, most of the people in the world don't care what the church has to say. They, 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 they couldn't care less. They go on about their lives, and they do their thing, and, and, and outside of the, the 40 or 50 faithful that come to church on Sunday morning, uh, they don't really care. But when something like this happens, all of a sudden, um, everybody cares, and everybody wants to hear what God's Word has to say. And so... Uh, um, we, uh, we, we, we are called to be on, on that front line and, and, uh, and, and, and to tell them, be ready to tell them. And so that, that sheer size of that vigil uh, was evidence that deep down people knew that the big answers to the big questions in life were found in God's Word. And it drew them. It drew them to church. It drew them to, to hear the Gospel. And uh, yeah, and so in answer to your question, um, I... I, I uh, our church was, I knew our church was going to be full that first Sunday. Uh, so here we are Friday night. Let's back up just a second. It's Friday night. And I'm sitting there until 3 in the morning. And all I could think about was I need to go home and get some sleep because tomorrow i got to write a new sermon for Sunday because the one I just wrote uh, is, isn't going isn't gonna to work. Um, and I, I, I knew people were going to be asking the question. They're going to, have to be asking, "Where is God in all of this? Why? How can a loving God let bad things happen? Um, all of these things." And so I, I, I uh, went home, got a little bit of sleep, and got up in the morning, and I started praying. <laughs> I, 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 I can tell you that that throughout the course of those couple of days, I probably never said, oh, "Amen." <laughs> I think I think it was just kind of a. I think back on it now, it was just sort of a, a constant, you know, Lord, give me, help me out here, you know, and give me, I don't, I, in, in myself, I don't have what, I don't have it, I don't have what it takes, and it, it ha so it has to be the Lord, and I, I, I kept thinking, you know, what the Apostle Paul who said, you know, um, you know, when I'm weak, then I'm strong, and, and, and uh, Jesus saying, you know, my grace is sufficient for you, and really, in, in a, in a, in a, Sleep deprived state like that, where 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 you're under the gun, and you got to write a, a fresh sermon, and you know the place is going to be full, and they're all going to be, you're going to have the rapt attention. You can't just go in there with a, you know, a sermon that that, that isn't going to that isn't going to address them. So, so I, uh, I I I went I went to my office and I, I started praying, I started reading reading the my, my Bible. I, a few of those passages came to mind, um, and I just started thinking, what in the world am I going to tell these people tomorrow when they when they come to church? And so I, I should back up just just to, uh, just, to, to, just back up one bit here. Now I, I don't know you, you guys are all going to develop your own sermon writing techniques and things. Um, me, I, I write my sermon on Monday. Um, just the way it is. I, I, I figured it, for me, for me, I, a lot, a lot, I know a lot of pastors take Monday off and then they write their sermon later in the week. Um, I, I like going in Monday morning and writing my sermon, um, and then and then it becomes like a stew <laughs> for the rest of the week. You know, I can go to Bible class and somebody will say something. Go, hey, right, I'll 
pop that, and, and that, that goes in the sermon there. I'll read something in my devotion, or I'll read something, and I'll go, yeah, that, cool, that, put that in the sermon. And by the end of the week, it's usually quite a bit different than it was on Monday, but there it is. So, so think about this. So I had the, so I had the sermon written. I, don't, I can't even tell you what it was. It was just a sermon based on the, the text for that Sunday, and uh, and here we are. It's, it's Saturday morning. I'm I'm running on three hours sleep, and I I haul myself into the office of the church, and uh, after writing a sermon, and uh, I had this one. I had the one that I'd already written, and I. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll admit to you that there was a moment or two when I thought, maybe I could just tweak that one up a little bit. <laughs> maybe I could just kind of make it work, like write a whole new sermon now. I mean, there's things I need to do. I got this vigil I got to get ready for. We got all this other stuff. I already got this sermon. Why don't I just tweak it up a little bit and maybe it can work. And then I thought, no, no, there's, there's no way uh, that that would work. And so, um, and a thought came to me that that uh, you know in the midst of a crisis we we have to we have to be prepared to, to take take these things head on and deal with them. I knew that our church was going to be full. That's not our church, by the way. But it was going to be like that, and those people were all going to be sitting there needing to hear what what God's word had to say. And so um, you have to here's here, here's a very important point. Of, 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 of sermon writing is that you have to know who you're talking to. I'm sure that uh, uh, Dr. Chambers, you're still teaching homiletics, right? So, mm -hmm. that's right. So, so he probably tells you over and over again, you have to know who you're preaching to. And so, in this case, I had to think, well, what are all those people going to be thinking about there on Sunday morning? What's going to be rolling through their head? Well, of course, it's going to be this. And so, you have to address the elephant in the room. Sometimes you're just going to have to throw the, the sermon you worked on all week into the garbage pail and start over. Um, and here's here's the thing, you know, um, God gives us what we need. I prayed about it, and I said, I, I, I got nothing. How, how, how am I going to... What do you even say to these people, right? And and so I began, I wrote, I wrote the sermon, I wrote it out, and I'll tell you right now, that was not the best sermon that I ever wrote. That certainly was not the best sermon that I ever wrote. And it was certainly not the best sermon I ever delivered uh, from the pulpit. But it was God who did it. You see, he prepared the people, their hearts were prepared, and he just he knew what I needed, just be faithful and 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 and, and read the sermon. And it just it just constantly reminded me that 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 it's not about me, it's about God, it's his word, it's his it's his church, and it, and we are just the vehicles through which he, he proclaims his word to the people. And so that was the job. I should also mention that that um, I also record my sermons every week. So um, in in I usually record it on like Wednesday or Thursday, and then and then I, I put it up on our Facebook page, on our church Facebook page uh, Sunday afternoon. So not only had I written the sermon, I'd, I'd also recorded it, right? The, by, by, but before this accident came around. Actually, I started doing that at Fort, for Fort McMurray when, when they had the wildfires in Fort McMurray. They uh, uh, found that they, 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 didn't, uh, uh, they didn't have a pastor when they came back, and, and, and there were not all, everybody came back, and the church was in kind of disarray. So the chairman of the congregation of Fort McMurray used to go to our church in Kitimat. He was the president of our congregation in Kitimat and moved to Fort mm -hmm. Mac. And he phoned me and said, he said, "Is there some way we could maybe uh, we could somehow simulcast the service or something so that we had some something for a service on Sunday?" Mm -hmm. And then we hatched this plan that I would just record the sermon early in the week because it would be difficult to get the times all coordinated. Early. I would just record the sermon early in the week and then I just send it to them. Then they they could run a lay service and then when it came time for the sermon, they just pop it up on the screen. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So that worked really good. And even when I moved to Humboldt, I was still sending ser sermons to Fort Fort Mac. So right up, right up until uh, um, I think uh, June or July or so, I was still sending my that, one, that first year, I was still sending the sermons to Fort McMurray for their Sunday morning services. So anyway, when that ended, I thought, well, maybe, maybe I don't need to record them anymore. And somebody from our congregation says, said, uh, no, keep recording them, keep putting them up on our website and on the Facebook page, because there's about 30, 40 people every week that were viewing those sermons. And so it's almost like another congregation in a way. Hmm. So uh, and, and I, I encourage people to tell your tell people you know, that, that this is available. 
And so generally there's 30 or 40, maybe sometimes 50 people that do those sermons on Sunday. Anyway, I tell you this because when the, the events came around on Sunday, I preached the sermon. Like I said, it wasn't probably the best sermon I've ever written. It probably wasn't the best delivery I've ever done. But people were bawling. People were crying. Um, we had prominent members of the congregation, I mean, of the community were there. And it was just raw. Like, I, 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 can't, I can't tell you how raw that was. And, and me, I couldn't, I'm a bit of a softy to start with, and I, I couldn't get through that, that sermon. I, I had to stop multiple times and just kind of collect myself and get back, back to it. At any rate, when we were done, the sermon, and everybody was greeted at the back, and, and what well, was over, I was just whipped. I, I, seriously, I had nothing left. And I was just going to go home and have a nap, because I knew we had this vigil happening that night. And uh, a lady came up to me, and she says, um, I know you wrote a new sermon for Sunday, this Sunday, she said. And so that means you probably don't have it recorded, she said. But would you consider recording that sermon and putting it up on our Facebook? And my first thought was, oh, really? Mm -hmm. And I went, I said, okay, I should do that. So Monday, after after the vigil, I went into the, I went into the church. I recorded the sermon from Sunday. I, I delivered it the best I could in front of the camera there, and I put it up on the Facebook page. And as the day wore on, I became astounded. Literally, my notifications <coughs> on my Facebook page were going ballistic, but by the time the dust settled on this thing, there was over 9,000 views of that sermon. 9,000. People, hmm. there was a share in Mexico. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Somehow, somebody in Mexico got hold of that sermon and shared it. Hmm. And it was just because people were ready for it. People were, were not only just in Humboldt, not just in our, our church, but people everywhere were, were invested in this crisis. And they wanted to hear. And they wanted to hear what a pastor from Humble had to say, who was in the midst, in the middle of all of it. And so I got thinking, you know, I, I, I could have just said, no, I got enough on my plate right now. But I don't say it because it was anything of me that did it, but it was, it was actually that lovely lady who kind of goaded me into doing it, otherwise I probably wouldn't have. And uh, as a result, 9,000 souls heard that God loves them, and that despite bad things that happen in this world, that we still have a God who loves us, and that he sent his son to save us. And so, I kind of came to the conclusion that, you know, in the midst of a crisis, you have to deal with it. You have to deal with the crisis. You can't avoid it. You can't sugarcoat it. You can't skirt around the edges. And you can't put your feet up <laughs> in the middle of all of that. That's not the time to relax. There'll be time later. But 9,000 views on Facebook, thousands watching on TV, and in the arena that night on, on national TV, that's no time to curl up and go to sleep, but to be as bold as possible, to lead the charge, to, to take the bull by the horn, so to speak, and, and, and when the people are receptive. Because people all have that same question on their mind. How could a loving God let something like this happen? And that was the theme of my sermon, and that's what people needed to hear. And so the answer, of course, is what we heard today in the sermon today, that we live in a fallen, sinful world, and bad things happen because, because there's sin in the world. And so death and suffering come to us all. And so we don't need to offer people cut flower, cut flower uh, band-aids to make a bad situation feel better. But you and I as Lutherans can bring to the table it's not a theology of glory, uh, not a theology of, of uh, well, you know, God will work this all out, you know, for the best in the end and, and all of that. But we can offer a theology um, of the cross that helps actually explain this situation and helps people grapple with it and be able to deal with it. That in our sin and rebellion, we deserve death and punishment, but God is a God of grace and mercy, and he gives us what we do not deserve, eternal salvation through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we can proclaim that. Now, I don't know what happened in, in any of the other churches on that Sunday morning. I don't know what sermons were preached. I wasn't there. But I do know that in our church, at St. John's Lutheran Church, 
the people got the theology of the cross. They got the full-on law and gospel that's necessary when, when something like this happens. And so that's what we, as, that's what we um, as Lutherans can offer that much of Christendom can't. That God gives us eternal salvation through Christ, even though we don't deserve it. And this turns that conversation from how could God, a loving God let something like this happen to, um, to, to, uh, to, the, to, to the showing that God does love us by sin, and proved it by sending His Son to be our Savior. And that's the consolation of the Gospel. It's the only thing that matters at a time like that. And so as pastors, you guys, I don't know what's coming your way, but you may go through something like that. Like, like I went through, or you may uh, go through something like in Fort McMurray with the wildfires or LaRange or that sort of thing. But the truth is, even throughout your entire ministry, there's going to be all kinds of crises that happen. <clears throat> and the gospel is always the answer. It's always the answer. Don't ever stray from that, because that's what people need to hear when they're in a time of crisis. And we're the ones that can bring that to the table. I, I, I alluded to that earlier in my earlier session, but I, I, I'm, I'm so struck by this that we as Lutherans should not be shrinking wallflowers. We should be leading the charge. We should be the go-to people in our communities, especially in a time of tragedy. People should know that when they come to us, they're going to get the answers that they need to hear. And so... <clears throat> The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's not that complicated. A lot of people mess it up, though. We're the ones that have to keep it clear and straight. The only difference between a large-scale um, crisis is that you have the attention of a lot of people. A lot of people are listening, and they're o and, and they're open. It's a time of crisis when people are the most uh, the most uh, receptive to hearing to hearing the gospel. Why did 9,000 people watch that sermon on Facebook? Normally there's 30, or maybe 40 on a good Sunday. 9,000 people. I couldn't believe it. I, 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 just, I, I just watched that, that ticker keep rolling. I thought, wow, people need to hear this. And what a blessing it was to be able to provide that even to the, not just to our church on Sunday, but in the greater uh, capacity. You know, I don't know why those 16 boys died that night. I'm not God. I know that bad things happen because there's sin in the world. But I know that God gave me a platform to be able to proclaim the gospel. He gave me the strength. He gave me the stamina. He gave me everything I needed to get through that stretch. And like I said, I would not ever want to do it again. If it, if, if it did happen again, well, I, I, I'd do it, but um, God gives us what we need. He doesn't leave us hanging. And I offer that to you as a comfort and an encouragement for you, to you guys who are training to be pastors. That no matter what happens, whether it's 16 guys dying in a car crash or somebody's dad who dies at, at, the, at the old folks home, that God will help you get through that. He'll give you what you need. Pray about it. Search the Word. Prayer and Scripture. Maintain your humility, your compassion, your pastoral heart. Love your people. And absorb all this theological training that you're getting now and put it all together. And you'll have what you need. That's what we signed up for. Those are the times that we're most needed. That's when God uses us the most is when there's a time of crisis. We might go through week after week after week where nothing much happens and we kind of get into the doldrums, but all of a sudden, bam, we got to run the front line just like that. And so there's lots of time to rest later, <laughs> but in the midst of that, that's not the time to roll up our sleeves and take a rest. And so after that initial shock of, of the vigil rover those, and those first Sunday services were in the rear view mirror, it was time to meet with the grieving families and plan all those funerals. There were uh, six funerals I mentioned in, in Humboldt, and uh, there was uh, 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 the, 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 the trainer, the girl, Dana, um, there was, there was uh, Tyler Bieber, he was, he was the uh, radio play-by-play -play guy that died on the bus, and there was four of the players. 
and the rest of the players were all from other areas. They were from Alberta and from southern Saskatchewan and whatnot. And their funerals were all in, 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 their, in their various communities. But we had six of them in Humboldt, and they were all done in the arena, in the same place where we held the vigil. Mm -hmm. And I did the first one. <laughs> oh my goodness. So now we're, we're Sundays, Sundays in, in, in the rear view mirror, and Thursday I've got the funeral for Tyler Bieber to do. So Tyler um, was, uh, I think I have this picture here. There's all those. There's Tyler, young fella, mm -hmm. who was, uh, I didn't know him. He was baptized in our church at St. John's Lutheran Church. Mm -hmm. he, he, his parents brought him. He went to the Sunday school. He was confirmed in our church. And, uh, and they, they had, like so many, uh, went by the wayside. Um, but his mom phoned me on Monday morning and said, uh, can you do Tyler's funeral up there? Of course. <laughs> well, I hear I thought I was kind of getting to be under the weeds a little bit here. Now I'm going to do the first funeral of all of those funerals that were going to take place on Thursday, so no rest. And so, again, I planned for it and prayed and read my Bible. You know, that was a good question you asked. You know, how, how, how do you... I mean, I can't, I can't package that all up in a can and tell <laughs> you, here, just eat some of this and you'll be fine. But much, much prayer and, 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 and just be in the Word. Like find, find, find it wherever you can. Like, you know, read your Bible and just, I, 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 I'll, I'm going to say one other thing, maybe later, I'll bring it in right now too, is that I had a lot of encouragement from, from my brothers. Yeah. And that was so important. My uh, fellow pastors, some, some of them I didn't even know. Some of them I never even met. Some from the East District. They phoned me. And there I am on Monday, you know, in my office, and I'm starting to write, try to write the funeral for the, or write the sermon for the funeral now. And I had to record, record my sermon from yesterday, get it up on the Facebook page, and write it at the funeral, and put together a whole service and meet the family and do all that stuff for Thursday. And my phone was ringing off the wall, and you know what? I didn't mind any one of those calls. I think in a lot of ways, that got me through it. So my encouragement to you would be, don't ever think you're bothering somebody by phoning them up and encouraging them or even popping off an encouraging email, because that really, really helped. And uh, I had guys, well, President Gimbel and Dr. Chambers both phoned me too, and, and I, I, I really appreciated those calls. And, and even though even though in the back of my mind I'm thinking I got to get to work, <laughs> I got, still got a funeral to do here. Um, it was it, in, in, a, in a strange way. It was those phone calls that and, and emails and things that helped me get that done. Right. And so, hey, I'm just I'm just a guy. I'm just a human being. I don't I'm not Superman. I can't I can't get I can't do everything. And uh, neither can you. And so we got we got to help each other. So I had I had the the ministerial yeah for all of that. But after that that settled, I had my brothers, my my LCC brothers. And uh, wow, what a blessing that was. Some of the calls were just uh, spot on, just what I needed at the time. So they asked, how would I get through it? Well, all of that <laughs> that helped. So when you when you know that you got a brother who's who's in the middle of something, please call him. And just, even if it's just a couple of words, just say, hey, I'm praying for you, and, uh, you know, our church is praying for you, and we're with you. So, um, yeah, so, the funeral, 2,500 people. <laughs> I don't know if you've been to uh, small town arenas, they're not that big. You know, they're not talking the saddle dome here, or, you know, or... <laughs> And what they call the place where the Oilers play anymore. Uh, it's not Rogers anymore or whatever, but um, small town arena, Broncos, you know, the place seats about, I don't know, five, six hundred people seats. Twenty five hundred people packed into that into that arena. And I led I led those people up up to up the Bieber family 
up, up the middle of the aisle from the back of the arena. We did it just like a straight up Lutheran church service. I, we had our organist in church <laughs> played. <laughs> we did the whole thing. We, had, we planned the service together. We picked the readings. We, we did everything. We picked the hymns. We gave a little song sheet to everybody who came in so that they could have the hymns. We picked the, all out of our Lutheran hymnal. Um, and I guarantee you, there uh, it was 2,500 people. They, there was no cameras on for the funeral because the funeral was was closed. To, but there was lots of cameras outside the arena, and they were all wanting a soundbite afterwards. Mm -hmm. But during the funeral, it was just people, and it was just packed in there. And again, they piped they piped it out to the curling rink and some of the other places so that people could could watch. And uh, it wasn't the fanciest of the six funerals. I went to all of them. And, and we talked about that earlier. I went just as a, you know, as a Christian, and and, and to be at, at those other funerals. One of the funerals, Paul Brandt showed up and sang "Amazing Grace," and that was that was mm -hmm. awesome. And uh, and, and there, there were some of the other funerals. There was there was all kinds of uh, stuff going on there, you know. And uh, our funeral was the first one. We I had nothing to. Nobody had anything, anything to compare it with. Nobody had anything. I had nothing. I had, I'd never done a funeral for 2,500 people in an arena. But uh, I just did it the same as I do it if it was in a church. <laughs> I figured it, it's, if it's good enough for a church, it's good enough for this. And, and uh, we just did a straight up Lutheran church service, you know, for 2,500 people. And it, when it was all done, I can't even tell you. There, there was a reception in the back where, where, they, where they put out some tea and coffee and some goodies and things. And I was I was literally mobbed by people. Like just they all were saying, Thank you so much for we needed that. Like the healing has had to start happening and, and it could only happen. I, in the way I was so glad that I got I got the first crack at it because I got I got to lay the I got to set the tone, right? You know, like it's it's about the gospel and the resurrection. And uh, what a blessing that was and, and uh, you know, <laughs> I, I I couldn't help but think, you know, this congregation wanted 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 the, their church to have a <laughs> a face in, in the community. I'm thinking, I'm not sure this is what they were thinking of when that happened, but uh, yeah. holy moly, you know, um, there you go. I I, I I I couldn't go anywhere for for days, weeks after that. I, I I'd go, I'd be in, in Sobeys, you know, buying some groceries, and the girl would come around and. The counter and give me a hug, you know, and and uh, and 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 it was just it, it just needed to happen. All of that needed to happen. But what a blessing that I that I could kick start it off with the gospel and the, and, and, and and that. And I'm telling you what, it, it, there's no greater privilege that we can have as pastors and to be able to do that. And and in, in front of a, an audience that large, it's just it's just astounding, really. Um, I, I I was vibrating for. <laughs> For hours when that was over, not not because of any sort of high. I, a part of it was I was sleep deprived and I was tired, but but just 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 vibrating with, with the enormity of what God had laid in front of me to do, and, and then given me the ability to do it. So at any rate, there's there's an encouragement for you. Take that with you. Um, you know, I don't know. What all you can learn from this today, but there's one one good thing. Just always trust in the Lord. He'll, he'll give you what you need. Because none of us, I'm telling you, are adequate to the task. None of us are adequate to do it. And uh, and it has to be God or forget it. So that's one of my little prayers I always pray. I always say, I got nothing. <laughs> it's got to <be> you. <laughs> you know, so. So over that next week, yeah, so I kind of jumped, bounced around a little bit here. But really... Um, I did interviews on the radio. People were, people were, were coming up, and, and if, if our church wanted a face and wanted a presence, if 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 if, if I'm just going to add one little thing here. It makes me so happy. <laughs> it, it 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 gives me so much joy, and, and I don't know why, but it does. When when people from other churches come up to you, come up and say and say and say, that was awesome. <laughs> Because they don't know what Lutherans are, you know what I mean? Like these people go to Alliance churches, and they and they go to they go to Baptist churches, and they go to Seventh Day Adventist churches, they go to all these other churches, and they have no clue what Lutherans believe or think or teach or 
anything. They just think we're some dusty old church that, 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 that's kind of Catholic. And, you know, and that's it. That's all they know about us. And when they get the chance to hear what we believe, that we can, that we can bring, the, bring the gospel out and just the law and the gospel properly divide it and, and, and nail it, they go, wow. You know, I, had, I had a lady said, who came up to me, she said, she, she said, she said, this was, actually wasn't at, at this, this was at a different funeral I did, but she said, she said, she said, wow, you just don't hear sermons like that anymore. And I said, well, maybe you should talk to your pastor, because you should. <laughs> 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 oh, no. You know, I wasn't trying to be ignorant about it, you know. You <laughs> made a phone call. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, and so, and so the, the thing is, you know, we, we have a role. We, we, have, we have a tremendous role, we as Lutherans. And, and I just, you know, we, we can't just keep hiding that thing under the, un, un, under, under the, under the basket, right? Like, we've got to let it shine with the city on the hill. we got the gospel. Like, we've got to let it, let it fly any which way we can. So I, that's my encouragement to you guys to do that. Hmm. The, the people in your town should know that you're, you're the go-to guy, right? you got you got it correct, and 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 then they will. They'll come to you. They might not come to church, but I've had I've numerous times had people from other denominations come to me in my office in, in my church and talk to me because they had a problem. And at my first, they say, "Well, you should talk to your pastor. You know, I'm not your pastor." And then they would say, "Yeah, well, I did, but I, I just want to hear what you have to say." So, you know, the thing is, I don't want to beat it to death, but. <laughs> Take the lead, you know. I mean, oh, we got we got the gospel, and we need to get it out there. Anyway, you know, I, I, I part part I talk about this encouragement. I, I uh, <laughs> one one of the one of the one of the best ones was I got I got a phone call from Vic Morris. I don't know you guys know who Vic is. He, he's a chaplain with the, with the troops in Iraq, and he called me up and he to encourage me. He called me from Iraq, and he, anyway, and he, and he he said yeah, we've been following all this from Iraq. You know, we're all with you. He said, so what we decided to do is we, we got a Canadian flag here, and, we, and we're going to get everybody to sign it. And we want, we want, we're going to send it to you, and, and if you could somehow uh, get it to the, uh, to the Broncos organization. I went, sure, Vic, no problem. So he's actually sent us the flag. I took it over there. It's still hanging on the wall there where, hmm. where, they, where, they, where they put it up. And that was, oh, that was Vic uh, Lutheran, you know, mm -hmm. LCC guy, spearheaded all of that. Hmm. But anyway, so, so there's, there's great encouragement that we can give each other. But sometimes it grieves me that we, we somehow um, sometimes don't like to open up to each other and things and think that, that our brothers are enemy and that's that should never be. <clears throat> so